Welcome to another episode of Fresh Off the Set. I'm Carrie Hawker Diaz. Thank you so much for listening today. This week, we are talking about a very important topic breast cancer. Last month, of course, was Breast Cancer Awareness Month, and no matter the time of year, this is still a very critical issue that we need to address and try to understand. Um, Breast cancer is the second most diagnosed cancer among women in the United States, and over 2,000 women here in Utah are diagnosed every single year. Here to tell us more is Karina from Optum, Utah. Karina, thank you so much for joining me today. Of course. Thank you for having me. Sure. Okay. So breast cancer is one of the most common types of cancer worldwide. Can you share more about how prevalent it actually is? Yeah. I mean, to reiterate what you said, it is the second most leading uh, cancer cause of death in women. It's only secondary to lung cancer. Um, It's important to know, I think, that one in eight women will be diagnosed with breast cancer in their lifetime, which is, I think, a huge percentage Uh, According to the National Breast Cancer Foundation, in 2024, there's going to be an estimated 310,000 new cases of invasive breast cancer and over 56,000 new cases of non-invasive breast cancer. Um, In those numbers, over 40,000 women will die from breast cancer in the United States. Hearing these numbers can be can be scary. Uh, So scary hearing that. Have has there been an increase in breast cancer diagnoses in the recent years? And if so, what factors might be contributing to this rise? Yeah, there definitely has been an increase in diagnoses, and there's a little bit of controversy on whether or not this is because, you know, we're getting better at detecting breast cancer. So are we diagnosing more people with breast mm. cancer because we have better detection? Mm-hmm. Um, or are there factors that are contributing to, you know, just more cases in general? Um, in regards to those factors, I think the big one is is lifestyle, uh, you know, obesity, lack of exercise, all of those are on the rise, and which are directly correlated with breast cancer incidents. Um, You'll see some studies that are researching, you know, our our food and preservatives and the chemicals that we put into our body and whether or not that has an impact. But I do think a big big reason for that increase in diagnosis is just because our screening is getting much better, which I think is a good thing. Sure, sure. Yeah, our screening is getting really good. Um, are there any age groups, you mentioned this a little bit, but are there any age groups or demographics that are more affected by breast cancer? Yeah, so breast cancer is most commonly diagnosed in women over the age of 50. Uh, in the United States, the average age of diagnosis is actually 62. Um, but in general, breast cancer is something that can affect people of all ages and all demographics. You'll see some studies showing that different eth- ethnic groups are affected differently. So African, African Americans have the highest death rate from breast cancer, whereas you'll see Asian Americans and Indian Americans have the lowest death rate from breast cancer. It's not necessarily whether or not this is more prevalent or more diagnosed in these ethnic groups, but the death rates definitely differ. And we could go into that, you know, with all the research that's going on about the demographics and how different ethnicities are affected by this. But Okay. How do you think that advancements in medicine and technology impact early detection and survival rates for breast cancer patients? Yeah, I mean, medicine, that's the great thing about working in medicine is that it's it's a practice. So there's, you know, continual advancements in medicine, which makes detection a lot easier, a lot simpler, less painful. Um, I think, you know, early detection is the most important thing when we talk about breast cancer, because the earlier it's detected, the higher the survival rate is and the easier it's it's treated. Um, And so I think when we have screening tools available that are, you know, covered by insurance, that are easy and quick, that are painless, you know, that's convincing more women to get these screenings done when when they qualify, right? Sure. And, you know, I, I wanted to know this. How much of a role do genetics actually play in developing breast cancer? Can you explain the significance of the BRCA1 and the BRCA2 gene mutations? Yeah, so, I mean, genetics plays a huge role in, develop, in the development of breast cancer, pretty much any cancer, which is why, as a provider, you know, family history is something that we go into with all of our patients. As far as the BRCA1 and 2 gene mutations, these are uh, tumor-suppressing genes, and sometimes we can get a mutation in these genes where they no longer function the way they're supposed to. 
Um, when you have a mutation in these tumor suppressing genes, this can increase your risk specifically for the BRCA1 and 2 of breast cancer, ovarian cancer, and even pancreatic cancer. Um, these are extremely hereditary mutations. And so, you know, if we have a first degree relative with this mutation, there's a 50% chance of inheriting that mutation from your parents. Wow. Uh, Wow. And I think it's important to know, too, that men can also have this mutation. So this is not a mutation that is solely in women. OK, OK, that's good to know. Not just women. Do you suggest that people get testing for these gene mutations? Yeah, that's a great question. And um, so prior to me going to PA school, I actually worked in a genetics lab where that was something we kind of specialized in was doing genetic testing for different types of cancers, because these mutations can um, you know, give you kind of a prediction of what your likelihood is of developing these cancers and what preventative measures we can take, take to prevent, uh, you know, to avoid getting these cancers. So I definitely think, you know, talking to your provider about getting tested for these mutations is a wonderful idea, especially if you have a strong family history of, of any type of female cancers. Because mm -hmm. um, potentially if you do test positive for that mutation, you can qualify for early screenings as early as, you know, as soon as you get the genetic testing done, no matter how young you are, um, and can even get more frequent screenings every six months rather than waiting annually or every two years. So I definitely think it's important if this is something that um, is concerning for your family. Especially you said if there's female cancer. So like if females on your like mom's side, on your dad's side have um, a history yeah. of breast cancer? Yeah. So, so when I say female cancers, it's, um, Cancers like breast cancer, ovarian cancer, uh, uterine cancer, all of those. Okay, that makes sense. Are there any lifestyle changes that can reduce a person's risk of developing breast cancer? Is there anything like we can do now? Yeah, and I think I kind of touched on it earlier, but I think people underestimate the importance of like physical activity. Um, so staying as active as you possibly can, um, you know, not smoking. Smoking has a huge impact on developing breast cancer as well as pretty much any other type of cancer, um, alcohol use. All of those are, you know, normal lifestyle changes that I think we talk about every single day, but mm -hmm. um, can make a huge impact on your on your overall risk. Okay, good to know. And how do environmental factors such as like exposure to certain chemicals or radiation affect breast cancer risk? I mean, we we're always hearing you know, we're going through these machines that give off radiation and, you know, is this like dangerous or how, how did those factors affect breast cancer risk? Right. And that's been a controversy. I think, you know, there are some studies that show that uh, the small amount of radiation that you get from routine screening mammography can increase your risk over time. But there are even better studies that show that the benefits of screening mammography, I think, outweigh the risk of radiation there, you know, the radiation from the mammogram. Um, sure. When we talk about like chemicals or radiation exposure, I think it's more important to talk about heavy radiation exposure. So, for example, we talk a lot about childhood cancers or any history of any other type of cancer increasing your risk for breast cancer. Um, so a good example of this is like children diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma, where they require radiation to the chest area as a young child. Um, and the younger you are at the time of radiation exposure, the greater the risk you are of developing breast cancer in your later years. So mm. I think those are, you know, the heavy types of radiation that are really concerning for, for your risk. Okay. Let's talk about the, the signs and symptoms. What are the like early signs and symptoms of breast cancer that we should be aware of? Yeah, and the, the unfortunate thing is that breast cancer is often asymptomatic, which is why we do screenings. So a screening mammogram is used for patients who have no symptoms. We're just doing a routine mammogram for detection of asymptomatic cancer. Um, when we do have early signs and symptoms of breast cancer, the most common ones we're looking at is obviously a lump or a bump in your breast that you didn't notice before. Um, any sort of what we call lymphadenopathy, so swollen lymph nodes in the armpit area any changes in like the shape or the contour of the breast tissue or even like thickening of the skin of the breast. And then a big one is also, um, you know, any sort of discharge coming from the nipple, whether it be blood or, or clear discharge that is not normal. Uh, those are all signs and symptoms that would then qualify you for a diagnostic mammogram or an ultrasound. Okay, good things to look for. Um, can you explain the different stages of breast cancer and how symptoms might vary maybe depending on the stage? 
Yeah, and that's another thing that is not not extremely textbook. So we don't know the staging of cancer until we do a biopsy. Um, and even, you know, stage three, stage four breast cancer can sometimes be diagnosed in an asymptomatic person. So we did a routine screening mammogram. We detected a mass. They did a biopsy. They checked lymph nodes and find out that it has metastasized and this patient was asymptomatic just going in for a normal routine screening. So um, that's the unfortunate thing is that it's not always textbook and the symptoms don't always align with, you know, the progression of the disease. Sure. Why it's so important to get those screenings done. Um, How often should women perform self breast exams and what should we be looking for? And do you think this is a good way to detect breast cancer? Yeah. So this is kind of a, a controversial topic, surprisingly. So when I was in PA school, Um, they were saying that we were no longer recommending self-breast exams because it's not highly sensitive. And I agree, it's not a highly sensitive exam to be doing a self-breast exam. Even a physical exam by, you know, a a licensed experienced provider is not very specific because Mm -hmm. by the time you're detecting breast cancer on a physical exam, um, you know, that would have been caught years prior on a a routine screening mammogram, right? Mm -hmm. Um, do I recommend it for my patients? I do. And the reason I think it's important is because I always think it's important for patients to be familiar with their own bodies because everybody's breast tissue is different. Everybody's nipples look slightly different. Everybody's, um, you know, everything feels differently depending on the patient. And so if the patient is familiar with what's normal to them, they're going to be the first ones to, to detect when something is abnormal. If that makes sense. Sure. Yeah. We can Um, pay attention to what might be changing if, you know, if we're aware of kind of like what our normal like baseline is. Yeah. And I usually recommend for women to do it at least once a month. Um, And the reason I say once a month is because breast tissue can often change with our menstrual cycles. And so if we're doing it once a month, I think that's um, a sufficient amount of time to be working around your menstrual cycle. Sure. Yeah. I actually have heard that, that there's like a better time. Is it like, right? Is it like a few days after your menstrual cycle ends? Yeah, so typically when we send anybody for a mammogram, you want them to be um, greater than a week prior to their menstrual cycle or post-menstrual cycle. Mm. Um, The reason why is we get a lot of fibrocystic breast changes during our menstrual cycle. And so um, it's really common to have more lumps and cysts in our breasts during, you know, our menstrual cycle. And so... It can sometimes vary, but it's it, it's not for all women. It's definitely for, for a lot of women, though. Okay, that's a good point. So about a week before your menstrual cycle and a week after for mammograms, if you're doing that, because yeah. you get a better, a better look. Okay. Are there uh, any symptoms or warning signs that are often, like, overlooked or mistaken for something else? Um, I definitely think that age is one of the biggest things that is overlooked and um, – for stories that I hear, the, the most unfortunate thing that I hear is, uh, you know, I was 20 years old and I had a lump in my breast and I went to my doctor and they told me this is normal because I'm menstruating and they told me I'm too young to have breast cancer and they didn't, you know, go further with any testing. So mm-hmm. I definitely think uh, age is probably the biggest thing that's overlooked because, you know, like I had said, prior medicine is practice and we base things off of Uh, patterns and what is more likely. Mm -hmm. And so, but I think that in those cases, that's where, you know, follow up with your patients is going to be very important. But as always, if you have any doubt in your mind, if you're looking at risk factors, you should always, you know, I think practice safe and rather than be sorry, but. Sure. Absolutely. And, you know, speaking of age, how let's get into what age we should start getting mammograms and how important it is to do regular screening and how often we should be going. Mm -hmm. So there are some differing guidelines for our clinic. We do a very, very good job at getting our patients in for mammograms starting at age 40 is when you usually will qualify. Um, For routine screening mammograms in the first um, 10 years of ages 40 to 50, we usually recommend either annually or at least every other year. Um, And then past the age of 50, we usually want you to stay up to date on it annually. Okay. I think the most important thing about having frequent screenings is that a lot of times the radiologists, when they're looking at a mammogram, they're actually comparing your old mammogram to your new mammogram. Mm. Um, because like I said before, everybody's breast tissue is a little bit different. 
Um, and so they kind of base it off of what is your normal. And so they'll look at the comparison and changes in your breast tissue over time to see if anything is concerning. So that's why I think it's important to get frequent ones done at least once a year. Sure. What if you have family history? Is, do, should you go more often? Um, yeah, so family history, I definitely recommend staying up to date on it once a year. Um, family history, again, is different than having an actual BRCA1 or 2 gene mutation. So just because you have a family history, so a mother or a grandmother who had breast cancer, doesn't mean you technically qualify for the same um, screenings that you would with a positive BRCA mutation. So sometimes in patients with a, a positive BRCA mutation, they actually qualify for a, for a screening every six months. And what they'll do is actually alter, alternate an ultrasound from uh, a diagnostic mammogram to an MRI so that you're getting some sort of screening done every six months. Okay. Okay. And with the, the BRCA that we talked about, BRCA1 and 2, if someone is diagnosed with breast cancer, a man or woman, do they, necess- do they have those genes? Could they not have those genes and still have breast cancer? Yeah, um, just because you have breast cancer does not mean that you have the BRCA mutation. Um, The mutation is just something that increases your risk for developing cancer. But just because you get cancer, even ovarian cancer, breast cancer, doesn't mean you you are guaranteed to be a carrier of those mutations. Okay. Um, The the people that we usually recommend, so when I worked in a genetics lab, um, we had people called genetic counselors. And I always think that's a great thing to look into if you have any sort of uh, cancer in your family. The the biggest risk factor for people with BRCA one or two is when you're diagnosed with breast cancer at a very early age. So when we're seeing people with, you know, at age 20, young 30s, these are being diagnosed with, with breast cancer. Those are people that are at highest risk for possibly having the mutation and we recommend getting genetic testing done. Okay. And with the BRCA gene mutations, is that specifically, I know you talked about ovarian cancer, breast cancer, do those gene mutations apply to other types of cancer or is it just breast cancer and ovarian? Yeah, so specifically the BRCA1 and 2 increases risk for breast, ovarian, and pancreatic cancer. Um, There are tons and tons of genetic mutations that are out there, though, that we are getting better at being able to test for um, that also correlate with different types of cancers. So I think, and that's something, too, that, you know, a genetic counselor has really great information on. Sure. Great. Okay. Can you uh, talk about the different types of breast cancer screenings available today and how they compare in terms of effectiveness? Because we all hear about mammograms, but are there Mm -hmm. other screenings? Yeah. So, um, you know, the number one screening is obviously a physical exam that's done by your provider. Um, A routine screening mammogram is just a a basic 2D, 3D tomosynthesis that, um, uh, looks at breast tissue from certain, uh, basically what we call cuts of the breast tissue. Um, people will hear a lot about, okay, do I need a diagnostic mammogram versus a screening? Do I need an ultrasound or do I need an MRI? Mm. Um, a screening mammogram, so just our basic mammogram that we get once a year, is our, you know, our main screening tool for asymptomatic patients. Our other forms of imaging are then used as diagnostic measures for patients who have either an abnormal mammogram or an abnormal physical exam. So like nipple discharge or a lump in the breast that we're concerned about. The reason why I have a lot of patients that will say, I'd rather just get the ultrasound or I'd rather just get the MRI. Um, And the reason I think it's important to, to proceed with each one as it's meant for is because each screening tool has a different thing that they look at. So I'll kind of go into this a little bit, but the the mammogram, for example, when we're looking at the breast tissue in a mammogram, um, normal fatty tissue shows up black in color on the mammogram, mm-hmm. whereas cancer will usually show up as white or a bright um, a bright color. But the issue is that people with dense breast tissue, that dense bre- breast tissue that's made of a, like thick connective tissue, also shows up as white on a mammogram. And so that's why oftentimes breast cancer can be missed in someone with very dense breast tissue. Then we'll go forward with the diagnostic mammogram where they can look at different angles and they can also look at the ultrasound. And the ultrasound is important at that point because it can look at different densities of of masses. So we can tell, you know, a fluid filled cyst from a solid mass, Mm. if that makes sense. Yeah, sure. No, actually, I... I experienced that a few years ago. I started developing more dense breast tissue on my left side. And so we did like the regular mammogram and they said, let's maybe do an MRI. 
um, which is good to know. So if, if someone's listening out there and they, they've been told they have dense breast tissue or they're starting to develop it, should they, should we go just straight for an MRI every, you know, every year? Should we still do the regular mammogram? And then if they think it's warranted, they'll give us the direction to do the MRI. What's your opinion on that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And from, from my experience, I think all of the radiologists that I've had mammogram reports from, they do a very good job at letting me know what their recommendation is. So on the report, it'll say something like uh, normal mammogram compared to previous mammogram. It'll say patient has very dense breast tissue in the right breast and would recommend um, further screening with an ultrasound or further screening with a diagnostic mammogram. Um, and so as a provider, I always like to follow the direction of the radiologist because I think that, you know, they're experts in that field. Mm-hmm. Um, definitely, I think for for women with very breast dense breast tissue and they have, you know, heard the scary stories about women being misdiagnosed because of their dense breast tissue, we will often try our best to try to get them to qualify for, a, you know, an a, a MRI. Uh, unfortunately, the battle with that is is insurance a lot of the times. Um, right. I think that's the battle for, for us a lot of the times is trying to battle with insurance to prove that, you know, we're ordering these tests for a reason. Um, but definitely if, if it's warranted, if, if there's anything that's concerning for us on a mammogram or on a physical exam or family history, we will do our best to push for that, for that MRI if needed. Oh, that's good to know. That's good to know. And for, for someone listening, knowing they have dense breast tissue, is that something that can someone get that over time? Does it happen to, you know, all breasts or is it, is it just depending on the person? Does it, you know, does age have any factor in it? Yeah, I think um, the answer would be yes to all of the above. Um, The thing with dense breast tissue is oftentimes, you know, you can't look at somebody or you can't do an exam on someone and know that they have dense breast tissue. Mm -hmm. It's something that would show up, you know, on imaging. Sometimes we can tell on physical exam. Um, But it is, yeah, definitely something that can develop over time. It's something that can also be hereditary and something that can, you know, someone could have from, from a very young age. So. Sure. So listen to your provider, what they suggest, because yeah. obviously that you, they see it in screening. So, and be able to tell you your best, your best route and your next, your next test, if you need to get that done. Um, how do you recommend women approach their healthcare provider if they are concerned about their breast cancer risk? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think number one is finding a provider that um, you trust and that you work well with. Um, I always, with my patients, and I learned this from, you know, all the amazing providers that I work with here in this office is, you know, building a good relationship with your patients um, is a great way to know someone's medical history, because in the end, you end up, you know, sometimes you see a patient and then you end up seeing their mother because they recommended and then you end up Mm. seeing their kids because they Mm -hmm. recommended. And so that gives you, you know, a really good family history just off of your own knowledge. Right. Um, And so I think developing a good relationship with a good provider that you trust is number one. And at that point, you know, you should be, really be able to bring up any concern that you have about about breast cancer and what your risk is. Um, but I think in general, just asking that question, like, can you walk me through what my breast cancer risk is and what I should be doing and what I can be doing to improve my risk? I think that's a great starting question. Okay. Okay, good. And to follow up with that, who should we be? Like, is this a general provider? Is this our gynecologist? Is this a specialist? Who should we be following up with and asking these questions? Yeah, so I definitely um, would recommend your your general provider, like your family practice provider. If, you, if you're established with one and you have a good relationship with one, you know, they're the ones that know you best and they know your full medical history, which I think all of that is important in, in estimating what your breast cancer risk is. But, you know, I know a lot of patients that their primary care provider is their OBGYN or their gynecologist, and, and yeah. they are just as, you know, just as... Um, experience of being able to to provide that information for you. Sure. Okay, this is really great information and good reminders. Is there anything else that we didn't get to that you would want to remind people of? And then maybe as we wrap up, we'll remind one more time about regular screenings and what age we should start. We'll just hit that again. Um, no, I think I just love to reiterate the importance of seeing your general practitioner at least once a year and talking about these conversations And I was, you know, when I have a patient who is at all doubtful about getting a mammogram done, I always like to lead them with this information, which is that, 
If breast cancer is caught early, um, your five-year survival rate is greater than 90%. Whereas if breast cancer is caught in the later stages where it's already no longer in situ, meaning it's no longer, um, you know, contained within that duct or or wherever it is, um, your survival rate can drop down to less than 20%. So, Mm. you know, get those screenings done and and detect something early, right? Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Big difference there. Okay. And remind people how often we should be um, getting our screenings done and what age we should start. Yeah, age 40 is definitely when you should start having this conversation with your practitioner. Um, And once a year to every other year is when you qualify for routine screenings. Okay. And it really, you know, mammograms really aren't that bad. (laughs) I've had a few. (laughs) It's not that bad. And it's so worth, like you said, to have that early detection, that peace of mind, just to go get it done on your lunch break. It's so fast. Um, it, It really is not that bad. Okay. Where can we go for more information? Um, I think the American Cancer Society is a great resource. Um, if we're looking at some websites, the National Breast Cancer Foundation is a great resource. Um, and I think, you know, talking to your provider is the number one resource. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, Karina, thank you for all of this information, reminders, and um, just something so important that we need to talk about, think about to take care of ourselves and our loved ones. Thank you for talking with me today, Karina. We appreciate you. Of course. Thank you for having me. Sure. And thank you for listening to another episode of Fresh Off the Set. Please rate, review, and subscribe. And we will see you next week. Congrats. You made it to the end. If you want to continue to freshen up your day, you can watch us on Fresh Living every weekday on CBS Channel 2 in Utah at 1 o'clock. You can also watch us on our YouTube channel, KUTV Fresh Living, and follow us on social media. We will see you next week.